Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for one of my favorite events here at SIPA, the David N. Dinkins Leadership and Public Policy Forum. I'm Karen Yarhimilo, and I'm the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs and the Adelaide E. Stevenson Professor of International Relations. This is the first time we are holding this forum in person since Mayor Dinkins' passing. And I see many of my dear friends in the audience, civic leaders, policymakers, activists, former students. He touched so many lives beyond these walls. And this event, this event is a testament to his leadership and his lasting legacy. Even though he is no longer physically here with us, his ideas, his leadership, and the principles he fought for will always, always be part of the DNA of this school, of this community. Mayor Dinkins was part of the SIPA family for 27 years. He was here as an educator, a mentor, and a beloved colleague. Beyond his leadership, what always amazed me personally about him was his passion for the local. Policy that directly affected communities, families, and especially children was what he relished. That is why he made SIPA his professional home after leaving politics. Now, SIPA is embedded in a university that is itself is embedded in the greatest city in the world. We are not just located in Morningside Heights and Harlem, neighborhoods Mayor Dinkins loved. We are also committed, passionately committed citizens to this neighborhood and city. And the mayor played a major part in the way SIPA engaged with the world. When we talk about engagement, we talk about it locally as well as globally. And yes, we engage with NGOs, community organizations, government, and academic institutions across the globe, to be sure. But first and foremost, we engage with our local community. So many of the global challenges we face are also local challenges that we face. We cannot tackle global warming without making cities like this one greener and curbing energy consumption at the local level. We cannot have inclusive prosperity if people in New York City lack basic services or are, doing, or are going to bed hungry. And we cannot make cities smarter or safer without new technology and innovations. And all of those are the themes that SIPA is really focusing on uh, in its five major global challenge uh, areas. This is really one of the great strengths of SIPA and something we are committed to in our course offerings and concentrations as well as in our innovative projects like Community Speak and our Center for Smart um, uh, Streetscapes. And this forum, this forum was Mayor Dinkins' way to deepen that engagement, to put forth bold new ideas and to shape policy at the local level and challenge outdated concepts all with the aim of making our cities more livable, safe, and prosperous. This evening was not only salute the legacy and leadership of Mayor Dinkins, but also his commitment to public safety. He fought to keep libraries open longer, not only to enhance education, but also to keep kids off the streets. He brought cops back on the community to beat and reduce crime. And from Times Square to Flushing Meadows, Mayor Dinkins was committed to securing our streets and bringing people together. 
bringing people together. He knew, he knew, as a boy growing up in Harlem, that a more inclusive and accountable New York City would be a safer place to live. Our speaker, our featured speaker this evening has been a tireless champion of so many of the same issues that the Mayor Dinkins fought for. As a former NYPD officer, Mayor Eric Adams knows a thing or two about securing our streets. He also helped protect the reproductive rights of women across the city and we are so pleased and honored to welcome here, him here to SIPA. Thank you all again for bringing with us this evening. Now let's watch a clip from Mayor Dinkins' 1990s inaugural address where he laid out his vision for the city he called a gorgeous mosaic. Thank you. I stand here before you today as the elected leader of the greatest city of a great nation to which my ancestors were brought chained and whipped in the hole of a slave ship. We have not finished the journey toward liberty and justice, but surely we have come a long way. This day is not a tribute to me. It is a tribute to you, the people of New York. and the government we inaugurate here will belong to you, not to any elite or any narrow interest. Ours will be a civic forum, an open democracy that hears diverse views and voices before it decides, a democracy that holds out hope for the hopeless and assuages the fears of the fearful, a democracy that appeals to what is best in us and strives to bring us together. I see New York as a gorgeous mosaic of race and religious faith, of national origin and sexual orientation, of individuals whose families arrived yesterday and generations ago, coming through Ellis Island or Kennedy Airport, or on buses bound for the Port Authority. In that spirit, I offer this fundamental pledge. I intend to be the mayor of all the people of New York. We will empower people and we will respect the need for neighborhood stabilization. I recognize that we cannot do everything we should, that our finances may get worse before they get better, that for now our dreams are bigger than our budget. We must assure long-term fiscal stability we face difficult times ahead and we will make the difficult choices. The sacrifices will be shared and shared fairly. As a city, we cannot live beyond our means and however, we will never be mean-spirited and we must never lose sight of our dreams. We must never forget the moral imperatives that count far more than money. Let me say what I said often during the campaign. I intend to be the toughest mayor on crime this city has ever seen. And I challenge our citizens to enlist in that cause, to work with the police and to depose the drug dealers from their places of power, to arrest them and convict them and send them to prison. The enemy is not just overseas in Panama or Colombia. In too many neighborhoods, the enemy is across the street, peddling poison to our kids. Lawlessness is as unacceptable inside the government of New York as it is on the sidewalks of New York. Official corruption is nothing less than another form of common theft, and it will not be tolerated in this administration. I believe that freedom from crime is a basic civil right of all our people as fundamental as the franchise and fair housing. So here today, in my first act as mayor, I invite each of you to enter office with me by joining a community anti-crime group, by helping a public school provide drug education, or if you're a parent, 
by insisting upon a new ethic of individual accountability and responsibility for your children and your family. And we must start with the most vulnerable and the most precious of all our people, our children. To that end, I hereby dedicate the Dinkins administration to the children of New York. And the measure of whether I fulfill my mandate will be how we treat those who start out in life during my tenure at City Hall. As we join together here in this pageant of progress and democracy, there is this morning, somewhere in this city, a child born addicted to crack, a child suffering from AIDS, a child beaten down by the deprivation of poverty, a child abandoned, a child forgotten a child whose dream has already been denied. No matter how rich and powerful we become, we cannot be satisfied when so many children experience the sunset of opportunity at the very dawn of their existence. For the children of this city are voices of hope, singing out the sweet songs of the future amidst the discord of daily life. They sing in Spanish and English, Russian and Italian, Korean and Creole, all the dozens of languages we speak in our town. The spirit of their youth says to each of us, follow your hopes and not your fears. And to them and to each of you I make this promise. The same one I made when I entered the United States Marine Corps, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Thank you, God bless you. Keep the faith. Good evening. I've been asked to uh, say a few words about Mayor Dinkins, as well as, of course, introduce Mayor Adams. Before I do that, it struck me earlier today that um, we certainly lost a great champion just a few days ago, Harry Belfonte. I had the one occasion to meet uh, Harry Belfonte very briefly at this same forum just a few years ago. And Mayor Dinkins was here, and that night we were honoring the late John Lewis. Can you imagine Mayor Dinkins, John Lewis, and Harry Belafonte in the same room? It was a spectacular night. Honored to be here. Um, Dean Yari Milo, thank you for bringing the Dinkins Forum back in person here at Columbia University. Please recognize our Dean. A couple brief words about the mayor. Um, I'm here at SEPA uh, because um, Esther Fuchs got in touch with me one day and Mayor Dinkins sealed the deal. The two of them, uh, I mean, as the saying goes, they had me at hello. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, was, I was certainly excited to be asked and I'm the inaugural David N. Dinkins Professor of Practice here at Columbia and I could not be happier. A couple words about the mayor, uh, but actually, um, just a little bit of background about him. And I want you to, um, for a moment, listen to the background piece and then listen to what I say about Mayor Adams. How did a scrawny black kid, the son of a barber and a domestic, who grew up in Harlem and Trenton, become the 106th mayor of New York City. It's a remarkable journey. David Norman Dinkins was born in 1927, as we said on the tape, joined the Marine Corps in the waning days of World War II, went to Howard University on a GI Bill, graduated cum laude with a degree in mathematics in 1950, and married Joyce Burroughs, and anyone who knows the mayor, his bride, whose father, Daniel Burroughs, had been a state assemblyman well-versed in the workings of New York's political machine. 
It was his father-in-law who suggested the young mathematician might make an even better politician once he got his law degree. As the newly elected mayor of a city in which crime had risen precipitously in the years prior to his taking office, Mayor Dinkins vowed to attack the problems and not the victims. Despite facing a budget deficit, he hired thousands of police officers, more than any other mayoral administration in the 20th century, and launched the Safe Streets, Safe City program, which fundamentally changed how police fought crime. For the first time in decades, crime rates began to fall, a trend that continues to this day. And as I've said on other occasions, Mayor Dinkins has never, ever received the proper recognition for the start of the decline of crime in New York City. So listen very closely. Eric Leroy Adams, born in Brownsville, Brooklyn. His mother, Dorothy May Adams Streeter, worked double shifts as a house cleaner and had received only a third grade education. His father was a butcher, had many personal challenges. Both of his parents moved to New York City from Alabama in the 1950s. Eric Adams was raised in a rat-infested tenement in Bush, uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn, and his family was so poor that he often brought a bag of clothes to school with him in case of a sudden eviction from his home. In 1968, his mother managed to save enough money to buy a house and move the family to South Jamaica, Queens. He was the fourth of six children, and as a young boy, he sometimes earned money as a squeegee boy. Mr. Adams graduated from Bayside High School in Queens in 78, but struggled to maintain good grades. He began attending college while working as a mechanic and a mailroom clerk at the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, receiving an associate's degree from New York City College of Technology, a bachelor's degree from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and an MPA from Marist College. He experienced an academic turnaround that he credits to a dyslexia diagnosis in college. Quote, I went from a D student to the dean's list and is now the 110th mayor of New York City. Mayor Adams' life story should be an inspiration for all of us, no matter what profession or what goals in life you may have. Resilience, perseverance, focus, and swagger. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the 110th mayor of New York City, let's give a big SEPA welcome to Mayor Eric L. Adams. Thank you. And there's, all, there's, there's only one rule. You, know, you, you don't stand for me, I stand for you. I'm here to serve you. Uh, I was walking in the building, and my, uh, I used to call my son, my little Paul Robeson. He was my idol. He was my hero. Uh, history was not kind to Paul Robeson. And as I was walking in the building, the gentleman had a sign about a Paul Rose, Rose Robeson uh, statue, and he was holding it up, and why don't you do something? And, you know, my team often try to keep me away from folks, and I just want to engage with people, and I just stop. And I stated, that's a great idea. I would love to do that. And it took a while before his breathing pattern calmed down because who he thought I was wasn't who I am. I cannot be defined on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. When you start an academic research project of Googling who I am, you will realize that I didn't read about David Dinkins. I knew David Dinkins. I didn't read about Congressman Lewis. I knew Congressman Lewis. I didn't read about Paul Robeson. I knew Paul Robeson. They guided me throughout my entire life and career. I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. I've been doing it for a little bit. 32 years ago, God placed on my heart to be the mayor, January 1st, 2022. And he stated to me, tell everyone you meet and see, 
So when you become the mayor, they won't think you just got here, but you fulfilled the journey and the prophecy. If you can take a perfectly imperfect young man, arrested, dyslexic, rejected, and now I'm elected to be the mayor of the city of New York, then you can take anyone. That young man in Rikers Island can look and see that my mayor was arrested. That young child that's dyslexic in school right now can say my mayor is, is dyslexic. That person who's in a homeless shelter is saying, my mayor lived on the verge of homelessness. Where you are is not who you are. And David Dinkins understood that. If you were to think about David Dinkins, you would not think he was about public safety. I wasn't the first to say the prerequisite to prosperity is public safety. You heard the speech yourselves. My entire guiding light of my mayoralty is based on my mentor, David Dinkins. We had to be safe, and you can do it with justice. There is no mayor in the history of New York City that has done more to prevent crime than what I'm doing right now. Over $50 million for justice-involved young people that are now going to be able to be part of the green economy through block power. Dyslexia screening. 40% of the inmates at Rikers Island are dyslexic. We're going to test every child and test the inmates so we can be preventive and not reactionary. What we're doing around summer youth employment, 100,000. David Dinkins broke the model with 30,000 back then. We're going to have 100,000 right in his spirit and right in his energy. Supporting public safety without abusive policing, it was through him that had to go to Albany to fight to get the police. And when he instilled safe cities, safe streets, homicides dropped instantly with the proper policing that he did. The record has to be clear. People want to paint the picture that the mayor that followed him after we demonized David Dinkins, we got Giuliani, and now everyone was wondering what happened. We created the atmosphere of a Giuliani to come into place because we tore down David Dinkins while he was there on the pathway to turn the city around. During his last year in office, you saw record drops in every level of the predatory crimes in our community while he put in place the community policing, why he put in place uh, many of the after school programs, why he put in place many of the resources to families. He was carrying out what he ran on, public safety and justice. That's what I ran on. It took 30 years for David Dinkins' vision to come back to City Hall. And my son used to always say to people when they didn't get it right away, he would say, I better recognize. This is the moment we're in. And instead of holding up the signs, take a moment and look at the history. From the days of 100 blacks in law enforcement, to my criminal justice reform as a state senator, to what we did as the Brooklyn Borough President, to the continuation of my first year in office as the mayor, and what we're going to do while I'm in this seat. It's a great moment for our city to revisit the spirit and energy of my mentor, my friend, David Dinkins. David Dinkins, I thank you for allowing us to have a conversation about this great man, this great leader that served this city well. David Dinkins, the mayor, loved New York and he loved the children in this city because he knew one day they were going to be sitting here in Columbia being the students that would shape the future for tomorrow. You are here because of David Dinkins. Thank you very much. Because I'm in the middle. to follow that, I'll tell you, that was extraordinary, uh, profound and powerful, mm. Mayor Adams. It really, not only were you able to capture what Mayor Dinkins did around public safety, and we all know there's a legacy that needs to be rewritten, um, and 
I think what you've been doing is truly, truly in his spirit, but you know, you're taking it another step further, which it needs to be done. And I'm wondering if you could just help us out here to understand more about your programs at the community level um, that are addressing this need to balance keeping our neighborhood safe, but at the same time, as you put it out, respecting people on the street. Um, because I know you are, you've put a lot of resources into this. So just give us a little bit more on that. You know, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu has a quote that I live by. We spend a lifetime pulling people out of the river. No one goes upstream and prevent them from falling in, in the first place. In our city and in our country, we have a downstream mindset. All of our energy is downstream. And we have profitized pulling people out of the river because we're pulling out black, brown, and poor New Yorkers and Americans out of the river. So why don't we go upstream? Instead of pulling people out of jail because they're dyslexic, mental health I uh, issues, lack of education, 80% of the inmates at Rikers Island don't have a high school diploma, equivalency diploma, uh, almost 50% have mental health illnesses. Uh, when you look at what we're doing downstream, if we shift that focus upstream, dyslexia screening, uh, making sure that we give people the mental health care that they need and not ignore them, then we can prevent the downstream mindset. If you do an analysis of our programs, our programs focus just on that. As I said, 100,000 summer youth employments, foster care children, six to 700 age out every year. We know they're less likely to finish high school, less likely uh, to be in a stable environment. Instead of giving them the support they need, we allow them to fall in the river and pull them out. What are we doing? We're saying every foster care child, we're paying your college tuition for you. And we're going to give you a stipend, and we're going to give you support when you finish high school. Then we're comparing them with technical training for those who don't want to go to college. Also, we put in place something called Fair Future. Why are they aging out? At a young age, we're giving them a life coach until they're 26, when 90% will graduate from high school. They get the support. I don't know what the heck I would have done if I had to age out at 21. I was calling my mother to 51. You know? so, I'm still calling my mother. There you are. 96. <laughs> and so what you'll, if you do a deep analysis of our administration, you will see not only are we doing upstream projects, and upstream policies, but we're dealing with public safety. I can't have a repeated offender, we call them extreme recidivists, carrying guns, creating violence, uh, serious crimes. We're not talking about stealing or jumping the turnstile. We're talking about violence uh, repeatedly over and over again. That can't be ignored. You know, We're going to give you an option of getting the care, the services, the support you need. But if you think you're going to inflict violence on our communities, which are predominantly black and brown communities, that is not going to happen. And that's not, not the city I'm, I'm going to be the mayor of. This is, I think, a really important thing that you're saying here. And I know that Mayor Nutter has conf confronted some of this when he was mayor of Philadelphia. And he's yeah. still working in, in this space now. And I'm wondering if you can, I mean, do you have any advice for Mayor Adams? Is that a bad question for me to ask you? But I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have a general policy. I don't give mayors advice. <laughs> um, but what, what I will say, uh, so the mayor and I, I teased the mayor when he came in. This is, uh, this is the third week in a row that we've spent some time Thank together. <laughs> we were at uh, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton's uh, 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 NAN uh, conference two weeks ago. We were on a panel together, and then last week uh, at the African American Mayors Association conference, the mayor was on a panel uh, that was called the Big Four. <laughs> so, Mayor, I want to take you back to that a little bit, but, and I mean, I can certainly talk about my time. Uh, there seems there always, it's not that it seems to be, there is a greater challenge for African American mayors dealing with issues of crime. All of you talked about it. Uh, you, Mayor Bass, uh, 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 Mayor Turner, uh, and uh, Mayor Lightfoot. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the extra challenge, I face those challenges. There's a higher expectation. How do you talk about public safety uh, in the context of justice? But people are doing things today uh, and affecting black and brown communities. And so tell us a little bit more about your approach to that. I took some, took some heat 
uh, for it, but the numbers did come down. Right. I said, well, my job is to not make you happy. My job is to make sure you're safe. Without a doubt. And not only actual safety, but feeling safe. Yes. Uh, what, uh, and what's, what's interesting, I was telling, we, we, we announced our budget today, and I, I told the reporters, uh, I didn't say one thing on the campaign trail and do another after I got elected. Right. I was very clear on the campaign trail. I said we were going to do pegs to find efficiency. I said I was going to put in place proper policing to go after those violent offenders. We took 9,000 guns off our streets. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I said we were going to focus on that. I stated we were going to invest in education. We were going to invest in upstream solution. If you start checking off the list of items, you would see, say, this is what the guy ran on. Right. So I'm executing exactly what I ran on. But I did something else. I staffed my team with people who were not only academically smart, but emotionally intelligent. <laughs> Look at the makeup of my right. team. Talk about, <laughs> you know, Talk about that. Uh, Talk about that. Talk about that. Gary Jenkins uh, was in charge of, 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 of our shelter system. He lived in the shelter system. Uh, you look at the first African-American woman to be a police commissioner, the first woman to be a fire, fire commissioner, uh, the first African-American uh, woman to be a first deputy mayor, Sheena Wright, uh, Reina, Holland Boy, the first Afri second African-American woman to be a, um, a chief of staff, the first one came under David Dinkins, the first Latino to run the Department of Correction, which is turning around the Department of Correction mm -hmm. to, this, to this day. And so when you do analysis and you look at my team, uh, the first Korean to be in charge of small business services, uh, the first uh, Filipino to be a deputy mayor, the first Indian, East Indian to be a deputy mayor. When you look at my team, you see New York, and they have to, when they sit down and talk with me and I interview them, don't tell me about your degrees. Tell me who you are. Who are your, tell me about your family journey. How did you get here? Tell me your life experiences. Because if you're not a person that has gone through a lot, you can't help people who are going through a lot. And that is how you solve the problems of the city. I mean, I think that the diversity issue is critically important and profound because without that at City Hall, and I, did, I spent four years uh, in Michael Bloomberg City Hall, so I had a very interesting experience as having been an academic my whole life, and he somehow believed that, you know, people like me could actually be helpful. <laughs> Uh, maybe I had emotional intelligence, <laughs> uh, but certainly I thought I knew a lot about politics, but didn't when I got there. I learned a lot. But the truth is, is um, I believe that the, the team you put together is really critical to your success. And one thing that I've observed, and, and my, my good friend Barbara Askins, who you spend a little time with up in Harlem <laughs> at the bed, and she, she may, I'm on her board, so you can imagine uh, her tolerance for uh, academics is very high. Um, I know you've been working with Barbara on yes. a really interesting creative program in Harlem to help your team work together to deal with the problems on the street, the quality of life issues, the crime issues that all of us are struggling with. And yes. by the way, uh, you know, I want to go on the record and say, you inherited an enormous mess, and I'll get to that in a minute. So I, I, everybody who knows me knows I won't mince words on that. I think it's really important to set the stage correctly for your accomplishments and what you've done in a very short period of time and the challenges. So, you know, could you tell us a little bit about how you're dealing with this really difficult problem of homelessness, increasing trash, the, the fact that shoplifting is, you know, a real issue in a lot of the small business districts all over the city. And something creative was put together working with uh, Barbara and the bid. And I think everybody should know a little bit more about it. Yeah, and, and you know, what's interesting ab about me is that uh, you cannot stay in a sterilized environment of a city hall or Gracie Mansion and not deal with the real issues. You, you'll never be a good shepherd if you don't hang out with the sheep. And uh, I'm among the people. Uh, I'm extremely comfortable of, um, among people. I'm on the subway system. Uh, uh, when Barbara reached out to me, we walked 125th Street in the rain yeah. that day uh, because I need to, to see. You can't lead if you don't see what is happening. That's why I spent the night in the 
uh, the uh, hurt with the migrant seekers. That's why I stayed there. Uh, that is why uh, January, uh, I went in the streets uh, without my security detail, and I visit people in the encampments, living in tents, uh, living in cardboard boxes, living in the subway system, under, under the trains, in the, in the tracks, speaking with them one-on-one. -on -one. And when I was there, I saw people who are bipolar, schizophrenic, living with human waste, drug paraphernalia, stale food, unkept. And I said, we can't continue to do this and walk past and act like this is not happening in our city. And so we knew we had to have a team of people with Deputy Mayor Williams Isom's to get on the ground and say, how do you give people services? And you see my senior leadership walking the street 12, 1, 2 o'clock at night. We're out there on the ground. There's never been an administration like ours. And so when Barbara showed us the problem, we said we need to respond to this because I'm a get stuff done guy. Don't, I don't like to get caught up in all the theoretical. I tell people all the time, I follow the law, but I make the policy. There's one mayor, and you're not going to tell me what can't be done. Show me how it can be done. And that's what Barbara showed us, how she opened up, used one of the storefronts to open up a place where all of our agencies can come to and do a, a cross communication. Because these problems are not one dimensional. You can't use the police alone to solve the problem. You need the police, you need mental health professionals, you need Department of Sanitation, uh, you need uh, homeless services, you need educators that's gonna help children get in school. And she brought that holistic approach at the storefront that was vacant where people and communities can come in and deal with quality of life issues. They were concerned that we were going to be heavy handed because when people hear about improving quality of life, they think automatically just bring in the police. No, you don't need to do that. Bring in the right individuals who have the resources to help people and place them on a pathway so that they can get their lives in order. Because people fall into three categories. Uh, category one, uh, you are in a state of just despair and you need to make some corrective actions to help you. You have those who are on the verge of that despair, and you have those that, that want to do the right thing and no one has ever given them the information to do so. Yeah, this is extraordinary. And I know you, Mayor Nutter, have tackled this kind of issue also. I mean, you know, we're in a university. There, there's this interagency coordination thing. By the way, we don't do it very well here. So I don't know how come we're teaching it and telling everybody else how to do it. But this university could, you know, learn a lesson from that storefront that you did, you're doing with Barbara. But Mayor Nutter. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Nutter, yes. talk a little bit about this issue and, uh, you know, well, comment on what May Mayor Adams is telling us now, because this is ongoing. Well, the, the thing about cities, um, in so many cities across the country, and obviously the mayor knows uh, New York better than I do, but, I mean, you know, it's, cities have many of the same issues and challenges. The only question is how many zeros are behind the first number, <laughs> right? So... Uh, it's public safety, it's education, it's jobs, it's homelessness, it's cleanliness, uh, and, and you go on uh, down the line. And, you know, obviously it just happens to be uh, Budget Day uh, here in New York, uh, always a challenge. Yes. Uh, everybody can make the case uh, for why uh, their department should get more money, let alone never be cut. Um, and, you know, I used to have to remind the folks that we don't have a printing press in the basement. Right. I mean, we really we really don't, you know, um, you know, you go to D.C. And so it, it's that tension. Uh, and so one of the things I, I would I would ask the mayor, you know. Eight point eight million people, 35 million different opinions, <laughs> uh, 106 billion dollar budget, over 250,000. Uh, under 6.8. Yeah, <laughs> over 250,000 employees. Yes. Right? Yes. For context for the rest of the folks, I tell this in my class all the time, the New York City Police Department is 50% larger than the entire employee base in the city of Philadelphia. 36,000 officers. We have 24,000, uh, 24, 25,000 police officers. So <laughs> how, do you, how do you manage all of that? How do you deal with the different forces coming at you? Uh, you've got to reduce... Uh, uh, 
uh, funding in certain areas, but you also want to make investments at the same time, and right. there's only one pot of money. Right. Tell us how you walk into that right. situation. Uh, well, well, well a, a, a couple of things, and I think Columbia University really should look into this, 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 this uh, hypothesis that I have. <laughs> so, uh, the, 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 uh, as she walks in, one of the greatest elected officials we have, my good friend, um, Borough President, always, Gail Brewer. <laughs> we Virginia Fields, yes. I, you know, this, yes. Is, yes. this is our, 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 we have two amazing Borough women Borough presidents. Yes, yes. I, met, yeah. I wanted to do that from the yes. beginning. Yes. Mayor yes. Dinkins would have been horrified if we didn't uh, uh, acknowledge electeds. Borough President Virginia Fields was a pioneer, really much respect and love. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we fell into the con concept of cities. I think the, the, Experiment of cities are failing entities that we have gone so far that we're unwilling to really acknowledge it. You cannot have an entity that's created where uh, uh, there's no incentive to move the needle. Like, if you fail in business, someone will go to a, a, another, uh, your competitor, if you fail in education, 65% of black and brown children never reach proficiency. If you can't go to private school, you stuck with it. If your streets are being clean, you can't pri uh, hire a private sanitation, you stuck with it. So there's no competitiveness in cities. So what if they fail? Mm. What are you going to do? You're going to wait next year, or next term, hire another mayor, then you're going to redo it all over again? You show me a city in America that's successful. Show me a city across the globe that's successful. I think we need to rethink and be bold enough and say, what should cities look like? And what should be the indicators of our success? How do we do that success in real time? When David Dinkins was mayor, uh, I was a computer programmer. I was a computer geek. I did not want to go into law enforcement. I was asked to go into law enforcement by Reverend Herbert Daughtry. But I was part of the, the five original people that did the, wrote the computer uh, code for uh, the pre-Comstat. You know, it was five of us that wrote the pre-comps pre, pre there. And so what we must do is break down these silos. It's crucial to break down the silos and have the agencies understand you have to work together. Because as Barbara pointed out, and as we're seeing across the city, if we don't collaborate together and not live in our, in our fiefdoms of this is uh, this, that's your problem, this is my problem. No, we're all in this together. And that is how we're going to resolve these issues as operating as a team in solving these problems. This is brilliant. And I'm going to take you up on your offer <laughs> because we need to be focusing exactly on this. And, you know, to be fair, um, this is something that we care about deeply here at SIPA. And, our, we have 140 students focusing in our urban policy concentration. And between me and Mayor Nutter, at least, if not half the other people sitting here, we are, we are thinking about a lot of these issues that you're pointing out. And cities are screwed in the federal system. That's doubt. my little coda we're, we're to what doubt. you're and saying. Is that a five-minute five warning? Uh, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> we're going to let Mayor term. Nutter so, follow up. Um, so I know we're, we're winding down on time. Um, kind of a lightning round question. <laughs> Mayor, you're, you're a year and a half in. Yes. Biggest city in America. People look to New York for leadership, yes. innovation. Um, for the year and a half that you've been in, um, thing you're most proud of and greatest challenge you face. Uh, the greatest challenge is the, uh, the m migrant and asylum seekers. Uh, the Republican Party's failure to come up with real immigration reform uh, is going to devastate this country. And the White House uh, not having a real plan, I think, is, uh, is irresponsible. And I've been extremely patient. It's been over a year. I've been having this conversation uh, that we could do better. Uh, it is wrong for those who are coming here to pursue the American dream and to be dropped in this environment. Let's allow the asylum seekers and migrants to work. They want to work. They don't want you uh, supporting them. They, and these are, many are trained 
of skilled professionals. That is our, that's the, my biggest challenge. It's going to undermine uh, the lack of funding. It's going to undermine this entire city. And uh, it's doing the same to Chicago. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot has shared the same, Houston and others. So that is my biggest uh, challenge. Uh, my biggest uh, success, I mean, you know, you could, I could just think about so many. I ran on making our city safe. <laughs> you know, I ran on making our city safe. A subway ridership is back up. Uh, four, four million uh, daily riders, customer satisfactory survey, decreasing, double, double digit decreasing uh, shooters, decreasing homicides. The seven majors are trending in the right, right direction. We just, we're investing in employment, investing in our, in our youth. Uh, when people... Uh, look back on this administration, uh, they're going to see that this was an administration that had compassion, commitment, and competence. Well, Mayor, I don't think they're, they're, they're not looking back yet. They're still looking forward. <laughs> You've got a lot more work to do, mm -hmm. and I'm going to uh, share with your team. Uh, I had five groups. Of st I, uh, today was last day of class for me, uh, <laughs> one of the saddest days of my life, because um, I, I just love being in the classroom. Mm. Uh, but a in-class exercise last week resulted in five great uh, uh, policy papers uh, that I'm going to turn over to your team uh, with some really great ideas from SEPA students. I love it, love it. And we need to hear, for, and I want to say to the students that are here, uh, you know, you can't, you can't be a detached spectator in the full contact sports of life. You can sit in the bleachers and tell how great you would be if you're on the field. You need to come get on the field and get some of this. You know, volunteer. Wednesday night, Every Wednesday, 9 o'clock, I'm on 34th Street between 7th and 8th Avenue, feeding my fellow uh, New Yorkers. If you're not volunteering, you don't have the right to criticize those who are in action. If you don't see, here's what I'm doing with my life. Norman Siegel has been recruited on college campuses to help with the homeless uh, situ situation. Anyone can critique. You can't run a city Googling from mommy and daddy's basement. You got to get out and get engaged. All of you should be volunteering and participating and making this city what you want. This is your city. And if you're not doing it now, you're not going to be saying no justice, no peace when you have car payments, children, college tuition, a job to commit to. You're not doing it now, you're never going to do it. The window's going to close. Thank you, Mayor <laughs> Adams. That was so spectacular. Um, microphone. If we can have everyone, if we can have everyone, we, the mayor has to leave. We've got a big city to run. We're not complete. Please, please take your seats, we'll, and we'll wrap up our program in a few minutes. All right. We're going to just spend um, probably about 15 minutes because we promised the opportunity for you to ask some questions. 
However, today the Mayor Adams released the city budget, <clears throat> as some of you may have noticed, and uh, he is about to be barraged with questions from uh, the Fourth Estate, and um, so he couldn't stay for questions. But since we have Mayor Nutter here, I figured it's worth having a brief conversation here. Yeah. Um, and follow up some of the follow up questions, and then if I can, you know, help with the responses, you know, I'll I'll just play a little back up over here, okay? But mostly, I think I'm just going to ask the question. Sure. So, um, so from your perspective, what are this is like completely broad, but I think worth looking at. What are the most important challenges that New York City is facing now? So, um, I mean, I really did benefit from uh, being at the um, African American Mayors Association Conference just last week and having the big four uh, on the stage together. And most of them actually talked about the same things. Everyone is focused on public safety and crime. Everyone's having that same problem. Affordable housing is a mess all across of the country uh, and uh, you know depending on where you are climate uh, I um, uh, 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 you see what's going on from time and time in Texas you know of course about California we've seen things here in uh, New York uh, in Chicago from time to time you know has like 20 inches of snow so or none um, we and in Philly we literally had no snow this year I mean I love snow as a kid I hated it as mayor um, because it costs so much, uh, but we know it's supposed to snow, <laughs> so that's, that's, you know, uh, problems to come. Um, but I, th I think the mayor talked about some of his greatest challenges. I did not have to deal with the kinds of, you know, craziness with people just sending folks on buses uh, unannounced. And it, this is a national problem, but it's also a mindset uh, yeah. issue. Um, you want to serve everybody, but there's no money. That comes with it, and you know something's got to give. So, you know. Yeah, I was I was particularly struck by his last remarks about, you know, cities kind of being broken, and I think that the asylum seeker crisis in New York right. is an indicator. I don't think cities are broken. I think the federal system is broken yeah. because so many of these problems are being hoisted sure. upon cities without the resources. It's like that old, you know, unfunded mandate BS right. that well, everybody had to deal well, with, but thing. now it's the same yeah. thing. I mean, well, what, what do you think about a, that? There's not a city in America that can solve the affordable housing crisis in their city without massive support. Uh, both from the federal government uh, as well as the uh, for-profit uh, development uh, community. There's never going to be enough CDBG. There's never going to be enough tax credits. Uh, and so how you provide some incentives uh, in, those, in those areas. Um, Twelve cities in 21-22 uh, had record-breaking uh, violent crime in those cities. It is difficult uh, to lead uh, in a really kind of a post-2020 environment. The pandemic, fiscal crisis, racial reckoning, murder of George Floyd, crazy-ass presidential election, insurrection, you know, uh, like five of the yeah, worst things. Over everybody's in, head, that one. Five but of the they, worst things They ever stopped in, and they realized, in, oh my in, God, in I should laugh times. now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the way I talk in class. Uh, sorry, Dean. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you saw, you, you saw numerous people in public office lose. You saw numerous people in public office say, I've had enough of this. Um, but, you know, I go to, I still go to U.S. Conference of Mayors, obviously African American and, and, and NLC. And so this new, there is a whole new crew that are younger, more media savvy, data driven. I mean, they kind of get it. Um, and... Um, and some of them are getting beat up uh, because people are angry and still don't have the resources or haven't yet figured out what to do with much of the federal funding that has come or is on the way. Yeah, I, this is really important and I want us to focus more on these policy issues. But there was a great question. 
from somebody here, I don't know who asked it, and it's really a good question for okay. you, which is, what are the most important qualities a mayor needs to have? Sounds like a question I got earlier today in, in class. Um, <laughs> you have to have a passion for serving. You have to wake up every day believing that you can actually change the lives and direction of people who live in your city. You have to believe that you have put together the best team uh, and that all or most of them are actually smarter than you and you should listen to what they have to say. Every, generally every mistake I made uh, was by not following uh, the advice I got from really smart people uh, on my team uh, and, uh, and paid a price for it. So uh, the mayor talked about his team, uh, what an array of folks, um, but I thought I had the best team uh, during my time. Um, because they were a team. Uh, not because they were my friends, half of the folks I'd never met before, didn't know who they were, um, but they had that same passion. Because what I want to know, I mean, I hear your qualifications, I read your resume. I, I always ask folks, like, why do you want to do this job? I want to know on the worst possible day in your position, What's going to bring you back to work tomorrow? What's that passion? What's that drive? What's that life experience? I may have talked about life experience. I want to know what brought you to this work. It wasn't the money. That's for sure. Right? <laughs> it wasn't the facility. It wasn't the, all the other accoutrements that, you know, go with, uh, with being somewhere. So it had to be something else. And that's got to be in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, in your being. And that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, and that's why we love you here, and we feel so grateful that you're in the Dinkins chair, and that's why Mayor Dinkins picked you. So um, I don't want to get, you know, emotional, emotional about that, yeah. but I could. But I, here's I, a... I have not yet cried at SIPA. Uh, <laughs> trying, to, trying to maintain that. Oh, God. Uh, I cried listening to Mayor Dinkins' speech. Yeah. Um, However, yeah. here's a pretty good question from, I, I'm sure it's one of our students, because it bears no relationship to reality. So, <laughs> if you had a magic, so I know, if you had a magic wand yeah. to fix any issue in New York City, what would you fix? Not how would you fix it, so it's not a bad question. Yeah, um, not just New York. Uh, Many cities. It's, it's, it's being safe and secure in your own being. Um, another mayor taught me, or told me, and I never forgot it, um, you can't have a great city if people don't feel safe. I've been in arguments. I, one of the proudest moments of my entire public service, on my 100th day in office, I was sued by the NRA. Um, <laughs> We had put in legislation. We have preemption in Pennsylvania. We tried to get around it, um, and the NRA sued us. And I hold that as a pretty big badge of honor. And what I would always say is that, you know, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, but I also believe I have a First Amendment right not to be shot. And so um, that people can go out of their houses, go to church, synagogue, mosque, temple, send their kids to school and expect that they'll come back um, you know, uh, that police officers, brave men and women who wear the uniform, that when they leave their families, you know, for uh, whatever shift they're going on, that they're going to come home. People have to be safe. You, you can build all the big buildings, you can have monuments, you can have, you know, all the great things, but if people are afraid to be outside to see them, it doesn't really matter. They have to be safe. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a consensus on this idea. And that's about guns. Yeah. It's about guns. No one should have an AR-15. No one needs a, uh, a semi-automatic uh, 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 rifle, pistol. To, I mean, it's just, you know, uh, we had that tragedy in New Zealand. I mean, you talk about leadership. We had that tragedy in, in New Zealand, I guess, a, a year or two ago, and the prime minister, in two weeks, uh, their parliament voted uh, to take 
uh, to ban those weapons and take them away. There's no reason for any civilian to have a weapon like that. None. So I want to follow up on this because this you know, cities have been at the forefront of dealing with the gun crisis, yes. but do not have the legal authority now, Maybe. even less, yeah. to actually, I mean, actually do what needs to be done. So right. in New York State and in, in New York City and in Philadelphia, we've passed very restrictive gun laws. And then the Supreme Court decided to, you know, have this decision in right. which, you know, we're, right. we're going to start worrying about guns in Times Square. How can mayors, what can they do, and mayors and city councils, yeah. anybody, yeah. you know, in the public arena who has the pos position yeah. you have, what should be done and what should everybody else in this room be doing? Well, um, you know, look, I'm a former mayor, so I'm the eternal optimist. I mean, I, I think there's always more that we can do, but I mean, the American public, uh, it continues to amaze me. I, I mean, I really thought we had a moment there at Sandy Hook that that might be. The, I mean, there had been numerous tragedies before that, but I really, I actually did kind of believe that that was a moment. And then, obviously, we've had so many things since then. One, we can't give up. Uh, two, we, we have to demand better. Uh, but you know, three, I guess, th there's, there's no politician in the United States of America that ever put themselves in office by themselves. Right. So that's about voting, that's about focus, that's about agenda and staying on things. You know, the Repo I don't want to be too political, and I don't, obviously I don't know everybody's, uh, so I say this as an example. You know, the Republican Party has been focused on overturning Roe v. Wade for 50 years. 50 years, and they did. As Democrats, often we find it difficult to focus on something for 50 minutes. <laughs> and then we're on to the next thing. We have to be focused, dedicated, relentless, and that's what they did on that issue. And, you know, quite frankly and bluntly, and, I mean, whether she was with us or not, <laughs> This goes back to 2016. We're talking about emails. We're talking about, you know, personal issues. We talk about this. We talk about that. We talk about the other thing. But I can assure you that if Hillary Clinton had become president of the United States of America, she would not have nominated three justices who not only said that that law was settled and didn't need to be touched, but yet turned around and voted to overturn. Stay focused. It's not about emails, it's not about this, it's not about that, it's not about the other thing. It's about winning and putting the right people in office. This would be a very different country if Hillary Rodham Clinton had been elected president in 2016. We would not have had a denier of COVID-19 during that time. We would not have had millions of people die. So sometimes it's about a little more than the day-to-day -day nonsense that people want to engage in. Long-term, focus, commitment. Uh, and so these are, these are, I mean, and then the relationship with cities, which was broken uh, under that administration. Uh, and of course now the uh, Biden administration is trying to, trying to repair that. Uh, but, you know, look, I got spoiled. Uh, seven of my years were under President Obama. Valerie Jarrett, who is, you know, a person known to be as close as possible to the, to the president, obviously other than Michelle. Um, I, jokingly, half, I said to uh, Valerie Jarrett one time, I said, you know, Valerie, I, I do actually have a job. Um, <laughs> trying to run this. I can't be on conference calls with you all every other day for this secretary and that secretary and the other secretary. But, I mean, the level of communication and engagement at the federal level to help cities was dramatic. Uh, and I think that, you know, this, the current administration is trying to, uh, trying to get to that level. But, you know, it's about voting. 
Um, and, and sadly, sometimes, you know, we get uh, the unintended because we didn't engage. So I think we're going to end it with that because at we a policy, yes, we can, because at a policy school, yeah. like we want to make everybody understand it's about yeah. voting. It it's about engagement. Yeah. In democracies, as our dean would say, do not work when people do not engage. You cannot take your democratic institutions or yeah. government for granted at the city level, at the state, national, or globally. No. Um, the only other thing I would say to that is that, uh, you know, you're not born until some elected or appointed official signs your birth certificate. <laughs> and you're not dead until some elected or appointed official signs your death certificate. And everything that happens in your life in between those two points is impacted or affected or directed by someone who got elected or appointed somebody to some job. And that happens every day in every city, in every state, and all across this country 24 hours a day. Someone is making decisions for you or about you. And what we say in Philly is, you're either at the table or you're on the menu. Right. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next year for the 25th Dinkins oh Forum, <laughs> which is going to be amazing. Be Absolutely.